Welcome to Julia Fundamentals. Here's what we'll learn in this section, Julia Fundamentals. A lesson on syntax and simple I.O., followed by a lesson on variables and their scope, local and global variables, meaning of static and dynamic, and finally, what is a constant in Julia. Next, a lesson on primitive abstract types and composite types. Next, a lesson on operators, elementary math functions. Then we go to Unicode and UTF strings. And finally, a lesson on string operations and pattern matching. Welcome to Syntax and some simple I.O. In this video, we will use a small program to demonstrate Julia syntax and expressions which are simple and clear. We will also demonstrate some simple terminal and some file I.O. using CSV files. CSV files are used to import and export data from spreadsheets like Excel. Okay, here we are in Julia again, and we're going to be looking at the coconut shell, or the, uh, the shell game. The shell game, you have three coconut shells and a pea, and you put a pea under one of the shells, and the shells are shuffled, and then the other person is supposed to guess which shell the pea is under. Well, we're going to do a Julia version of that here. Here we have A is going to be shell A. That's our variable name, is shell A. And underneath that shell, we're going to have an integer, and here we have another shell, B, underneath its shell, it's going to be a matrix, a two by two matrix. This, this shell here will have the word P, uh, it's a string, P-E-A, under shell C. So let's do that. Okay, here's three. It's just an integer, int64. Here we printed uh, B, which is our array. It's, it's an array, a uh, two by two array. The third one we have is P. Uh, yeah, P is a C. P is in C, which is a string. <laughs> okay, now, so this is what our lineup looks like before we start shuffling the shells. Okay, so the lineup is, we, we see this is shell A, shell B, and shell C. Okay, we're variable A, B, and C. Okay, now we're gonna shuffle them. So here we have the way we can shuffle, which is here we get the contents of B are gonna be put into A, contents of C are gonna be put into B, and the contents of A are gonna be put into C. We're going to do this a couple of times here. So let's do this really quickly, like they would do in the game. And you're supposed to guess what, where, what shell these things are going to be under. And I'm, let, me, let me get all three of these, actually. I'll see if you guessed right. Here we go. Guess what? After we have P in the first place, the second one still contains the matrix, and the third one now contains what we used to be in the first place. Did you guess it right? Okay, congratulations. This time we're going to solve a problem of determining the depth of a well. And what we're going to do is drop a rock in the well and listen for the splash. And the only thing we have is a rock and a stopwatch. So drop the rock, we start the stopwatch, and when we hear the rock hitting the water, we hear the splash, then we stop the stopwatch. Okay, so we're going to need a couple of things for this. We're going to need acceleration due to gravity, uh, which is 9.8065. We're also going to need the velocity of sound, which under normal pressure and temperature is 343 meters per second. Now, for the going down, we have essentially the force of gravity acting. So one half g times the time to go down squared is the distance to the bottom of the well. And going from the bottom to the top is just the velocity of sound times the time to the top. And the time to the bottom and the time to the top add together to be the time that we got on our stopwatch when we uh, did our experiment. We know that this equation should equal this equation, so we set them equal to each other. And so those two together should equal zero. And then we have another equation, which is time down plus the time up equals time. Okay, we substitute for Tu, T minus Td in the first equation, and we get this equation down here, which is a quadratic. Using a quadratic formula, we can solve it, and here it is. So what we're going to do, first of all, is put in, okay, we got the uh, gravitational constant, we got the velocity of sound, and now it's asking us for the splash time. Now there's a time from when we drop the rock to the splash time, and just for fun, I'll put in 5 for 5 seconds. Okay, so we have floating point of 5.0. It's in float32 format. That doesn't matter much. All these other ones will end up being uh, 
these two up here default to float 64 and it'll make the appropriate arrangements when we get down here because it doesn't matter what whether it's integer or whether it's floating point uh, ultimately you'll get the right answer because you can mix all of these so here we have a formula let's take a look at this first one well first of all let's put all of these down here we'll go ahead and execute it and you can see that we got Probably should have done that as a, as a group, but anyway, it looks like it's 107 meters to go to the bottom of the well, and uh, so we have uh, the sound time is it only took 0.31 seconds for the sound to come from the bottom of the well to the top, but the fall time is 4.68 seconds. That's for the rock to go down to the bottom of the well, and this is the time for the sound to come back, and uh, and it's 107 meters, and we cut check that by plugging it into the other little formula. And it also got a, came out with 107 meters. Now, of course, that's going to be uh, no more accurate than the stopwatch and our ability to stop the watch exactly on the time. So this isn't going to be very all these re all the rest of these decimal places aren't really relevant here. But we'll get to using formatted data later, so you don't have to print out all these decimal places, which are meaningless. Okay, look, coming back to the formula, here we have 0.5g. Notice there's no multiplication sign there; none is necessary. So this is a numerical constant. And then we have that times the time down squared. So the time down squared, this is just your regular gravity formula for distance traveled falling. And then this is the other formula. And you notice up here we use square root. We only use the positives. If you're familiar with solving quadratic equations, there's a positive and negative sign. Usually there's a plus minus sign. We only are interested in the positive square root because we, never, we know we didn't fall a negative distance. So there we are. This is so easy to interpret because it just looks like regular mathematical notation here, except that we have this little thing for exponentiation. It's different from ordinary, uh, and we don't have a square root sign. We have just the words. This is a, a function, square root. And this whole area, this whole quantity, all the way over to here is over, over g. Uh, there's not much more to show here, so let's go on to the next thing. Well, before we go on to the next part of this, this dollar sign followed by a variable name takes that variable, whatever type it is, converts it to text, which is then concatenated with the rest of the string here. So we have these variables when they got printed out. And it's not very discriminate as far as prints out all of the digits of the uh, that it can, which may be totally meaningless as we saw. And later on, we'll look into formatted output. Now, the other thing we'll do is we're just going to take a shopping list. Let's take a look at the shopping list. That's, that's this str1.csv. It's a shopping list. So here it is in uh, salt, pepper, parsley, tomatoes, potatoes, and milk. Well, this particular shopping list is actually uh, not very interesting, but let's go back to our program. We're going to put numbers in front of the shopping list, and you'll see that momentarily. So let's take this thing. Read it in. There's a few things we need to note in here, but let's copy it first and move it on down. Okay, so here's our new shopping list here, and it's in CSV format. Uh, we'll see it actually over here. There it is. See, now we put a number in front of each of the items, and so our shopping list is an official item list now. Let me go back to this. Now, let's take a look at this. First of all, I said count here, and I said global count here. Now, I can read anything outside of here that's going to be considered global to this, but I cannot write it unless I say global in front of it. So that's that way I know that this is not a local variable to this while loop. This is a global variable that I can write because I'm incrementing it by one. So I'm actually writing the variable. So that is a little important lesson. It's very important because in some languages, things don't work this way. Okay, so demonstrated this and let's go back to, oh, here's... Uh, done down here. So we got to the end of this, which is not a great feat. You can also see that here's what we've learned. How variable names are just labels. What Julia syntax looks like. How to communicate with your terminal and console window. Reading and writing CSV files. It can be used with Excel or OpenOffice.